Welcome to the Banner of Truth magazine podcast, where each week we bring you selected content from the magazine for your encouragement and edification. We continue this week with part two of our three-part mini-series on public worship, this time looking at children and the public worship of God. Our first selection is from the September 1972 issue of the magazine, number 108. It's by Ian Murray and is entitled Children and the Sermon. C.H. Spurgeon once said the following in a Metropolitan Tabernacle sermon. Quote, I begin to feel more and more that it is a mistake to divide the children from the congregation. I believe in special services for children, but I would also have them worship with us. If our preaching does not teach children, it lacks some element which it ought to possess. I like to see the congregation made up not all of the young, nor all of the old, but some of all sorts gathered together. Unquote. We believe that Spurgeon had good cause to give this warning in 1873, and the question is now long overdue. How much have churches lost by their all too common acceptance of the non attendance of children at the preaching of the Word of God? It is necessary to be clear at the outset about what is not being discussed. The question is not, how are we to reach children with no church connection? Nor, what means are best suited to bring the gospel to them? Important though these issues are, but we are simply asking, is it right for a church to arrange for her children to be provided with some other instruction during the time when adults are listening to the sermon? The principal argument for the arrangement by which children leave the service before the sermon rests upon the view that another form of oral or visual instruction for the younger age group is preferable to the sermon. Consequently, a Bible class or Sunday school is scheduled to occupy the time which the remainder of the public worship will take. In liberal churches, the case for such a division is axiomatic. That is, the themes of their sermons, social concerns, ecumenical issues, war, race, etc., are not relevant for children. The truth that sin, the wrath of God, redemption and holiness are as necessary for children as for adults has long been rejected. But obviously, in evangelical churches, the case is conceived differently. Biblical teaching, it is said, should be given to children in the form most easily understood, and they therefore need a different type of instruction, and cannot be most effectively taught simultaneously with grown-ups. It is usually a corollary of this viewpoint that if children are to be addressed in the public services of the church, then it must be a special address or sermon for them. If the children have their own 10 minutes in the church service, then withdraw for Sunday school, they are getting, so it is thought, the best of both worlds. This argument proceeds upon the assumption that simplicity of communication is the primary need in the instruction of children, and that any teaching which cannot readily be understood must be avoided. Apparently reasonable and obvious though this sounds, it is not scriptural. According to scripture, the primary need of both adult and child is the removal of the aversion to God which is in the human heart. While that aversion remains, in any age group there will be darkness of mind, and where it is removed by the teaching of the Holy Spirit, there will be an intelligent reception of truth. What this means in practice is that a true appreciation of a child's need will lead us to depend upon God. And such a dependence includes faith in the means appointed by Christ for the conversion and instruction of sinners. Now, it is not in dispute whether parents or Sunday school teachers may look for God's blessing upon the teaching which they give to children. 
The question is whether, when Christian congregations are assembled for worship, children should be removed before the word is preached. The claim that they must not be so removed rests firmly upon the truth that preaching is a divine institution. It does not stand upon the same footing as a Bible class or Sunday school, which, though they may be useful and expedient branches of church work, are nevertheless not commanded by God. Preaching, the scriptures tell us, is the means of grace for the ingathering and upbuilding of souls, and far from any suggestion that public assemblies for the ministry of the word are to be limited to those of more adult years, there is explicit evidence to the contrary. If we find, as we do, that the removal of aversion to God depends upon the Holy Spirit, and that, further, it is preeminently the authoritative proclamation of the word by those sent for that work which the Spirit promises to accompany with light and power, then the removal of children from the congregation before the sermon ought surely to be unthinkable. The Spirit of God, reads the larger catechism, question 155, maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of enlightening, convincing, and humbling sinners. We consider that by far the most important explanation for the church's problems with her youth in Britain and the United States lies in her failure to maintain the biblical and reformed view of preaching. Too often, preaching has been regarded merely as one form of instruction among many. No significant difference is seen between the message of the pulpit and the Sunday school lesson, whereas the sermon ought to be a declaration as from Christ, delivered in His name and to be attended on by all hearers as in His presence. Preaching, in the biblical context, is a part of worship, and the stranger to God, whether child or adult, who attends upon the word of God amidst a company of worshippers, may be constrained, quote, to worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. See 1 Corinthians 14.25. Why was it that such preachers as Whitfield, McShane, Spurgeon, and countless more in the past held many children among their regular hearers? It cannot be explained merely by the wishes of their parents, still less by any attempt on the part of these preachers to use the modern children's address. The children simply attended upon their regular preaching. Yet, what modern publisher of Sunday school material would consider Whitfield to be suitable for infants and youth? And how, if one accepts the modern view, is one to explain the influence that such a somber preacher as David Brainerd had with youth? Consider, for example, the following scene, which resulted from his preaching at Crossweeksung, New Jersey. Among all persons of all ages were bowed down with concern together. Old men and women who had been drunken wretches for many years, and some little children, not more than six or seven years of age, appeared in distress for their souls, as well as persons of middle age. And it was apparent these children, some of them at least, were not merely frighted with seeing the general concern, but were made sensible of their danger, the badness of their hearts, and their misery without Christ, as some of them expressed it. We believe the explanation is, as we already noted, that preaching is not just one form of instruction comparable to a Bible class or private instruction. It is the first means given by Christ, and therefore, with faithful messengers, an influence and an unction ought to attend the word, such as will impress, even though it does not necessarily convert, every age group. To suppose that children may be more profitably occupied during the time of the sermon by being given another form of instruction is a serious error. 
It is taking children away from the very place where they ought to learn the power of the Word of God. The church is altogether another sphere from the school. God is there in a special way, and children have need to know a constraint laid upon them from heaven so that they both listen and worship. All this is not, of course, to say that being present during the sermon will necessarily do children good. We are far from holding the view that restless, inattentive children should be encouraged to remain in church, notwithstanding the disturbance which they cause. If they are incapable of attention, then they are, as a general rule, incapable of receiving profit. And in that case, a plea that a church should tolerate the distractions which they cause to others is absurd. It is no accident that the instruction and discipline of children are conjoined in Scripture. If parents will not train their children when to be silent and will not guide them in prayer and family worship at home, they may have to recognize that they are depriving them of their rightful place in public worship. It may also be said that the children who do sit quietly through sermons can be as mentally inattentive as those who do not. That is true, and the fault may be as much in the pulpit as in the child. If ministers prepare sermons without any consideration of the fact that children will be listening, then the children will all too quickly conclude that what is said was never really meant for their ears. Nevertheless, if children are trained in the habit of public worship, and if, as was common in Puritan times, parents use the sermon for further conversation in the family later in the day, there can be a greater intake in mind and conscience much earlier than is popularly supposed. And let not the value of the knowledge and serious impressions which are gained prior to conversion be depreciated. In many cases, those early lessons have laid the foundation for lives of preeminent usefulness. Spurgeon's own testimony is worth hearing. I do hold that there is no doctrine of the word of God which a child, if he be capable of salvation, is not capable of receiving. I would have children taught all the great doctrines of truth, without a solitary exception, that they may, in their after days, hold fast by them. I can bear witness that children can understand the scriptures. For I am sure that, when but a child, I could have discussed many a knotty point of controversial theology. In fact, children are capable of understanding some things in early life, which we hardly understand afterwards. We have sought to deal with the argument that the sermon is not the best means the church can use to help children. There is another argument to be touched upon before we close. Whatever may have been true in the past, it is said, the church today will lose her young people if they are not given an alternative to sitting through a sermon. So, the practice of removing children before the sermon should be continued not for any theological reason, but simply on the grounds of wise expediency. As always, the truth is that nothing is ever genuinely expedient for the church, when it contravenes scripture. The practices of the last hundred years have not led to the youth of the church being more steadfast and better instructed. In so many cases, the Sunday school has been the main spiritual institution for the young. And when that has been outgrown, children have already passed through their formative years without being trained in the habit of full attendance upon public worship. In their infancy, their elders taught them, by deed if not by word, that the sermon was not for them, and by the time childhood is exchanged for youth, it is often too late to reverse this attitude. Dr. John Kennedy of Dingwall, one of the most acute observers of the dangers which evangelicalism was unwittingly encouraging in the late 19th century, saw this tendency clearly in his own day. 
In the course of commenting upon the disproportionate importance which was being attached to Sunday school work, he wrote, Attendance in the Sabbath school is not infrequently substituted for attendance, along with adults, at the stated diets of worship. This result has been realized in a very marked degree where the Sabbath school system has been zealously carried out, and the consequence must be that those who as children acquired not the habit of coming to hear the gospel will not care to acquire it at any subsequent period of their lives. What has so often happened today is that the number of committed Christian families in churches has so declined that almost all youth effort is arranged for children outside the church, whose parents do not attend regularly. These children, it appears, cannot be held except by meetings or classes other than public worship. And as they form a large majority, such children as do belong to the church are expected to fall in with the arrangements for the larger group. When an appeal is made that this system should end, and that children whose parents are in the church should be with their parents, it will be said that a distinction between children would be invidious, and that any change in the present system would be to risk losing the majority. But... By their early teens, the majority are already unhappily being lost to the church, and conditions today have reached such a point that there is no prospect for the future except in a determined resolution to return to the rule of Scripture. When that is done, we believe it will be seen that the family is a basic unit, that the church has a primary, not sole, responsibility to the families in her midst, and that, through the powerful preaching of the word of God to the young, a generation more deeply taught in truth and godliness can yet be raised up. There are a number of churches today who have never given up the reformed view that children should be present throughout public worship. Though it has not been broadcast to the world, some of these churches have been blessed in the influence which the preaching has exerted upon their young. For five years, it was the experience of the writer to worship at Westminster Chapel under the ministry of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. In that church, a creche was provided for infants, but only until they were old enough to be silent in public worship. Thus, from the age of two or three, it was common for many children to be present throughout the whole service. Certainly no children remained in a creche beyond the age of four. And before many years of attendance in the services had passed, a number of children could intelligently follow preaching which some adults were ready to regard as too profound. There is a passing reference to this in Dr. Lloyd-Jones's recent volume, Preaching and Preachers. Referring to the number of letters he received at the time of his illness a few years ago, he goes on, The letter that I prize was from a little girl aged 12 who wrote on behalf of herself and her brother, unbeknown to their parents, saying that they were praying for my recovery and hoping that I would soon be back in the pulpit. She then gave the reason for this, and that is what pleased me so much. She said, Because you are the only preacher we can understand. The sovereign grace of God reaches the young, and still it is true that the Lord of heaven and earth hides gospel truths from the wise and prudent and reveals them unto babes. Shifting gear now slightly, we're going to read an article from Matt Purdy, senior pastor at Carlisle Reformed Presbyterian Church in Pennsylvania, USA. It's entitled, 10 Benefits of Corporate Worship for Our Children. Having your children with you in worship can be hard. It can be hard for the parents, for the children, and for the rest of the congregation. The squirming, the shuffling of papers, the loud whispers and the louder cries all can make it challenging to have our children with us in corporate worship. 
but the benefits far outweigh the challenges. Here are 10 benefits of corporate worship for our children. 1. Singing. Our children are blessed as they hear the whole church singing to God joyfully and heartily with full hearts and full voices. They learn that the truths we sing are truths worth singing about, and they learn to sing. They learn how to sing the Psalms. They learn the great hymns that have been passed down to us from previous generations of believers. They learn to obey Paul's command in Ephesians 5.19, address one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. They learn to sing to the Lord with the congregation. 2. Prayer To be sure, children learn to pray by listening to their parents pray, but they also learn to pray by listening to their pastors pray. They learn to pray along with those who are leading in prayer. They add their voices to the congregation as we all pray the Lord's Prayer together or join together in a corporate confession of sin. They learn to add their hearty Amen to the end of the prayers as a way of agreeing with what has been prayed and making it their own. They learn to pray in corporate worship. 3. Reading Paul told Timothy to devote himself to the public reading of Scripture, 1 Timothy 4.13, and this is for the benefit of the whole congregation, of which children are a part. Children should read the Bible in their home or have it read to them, but they should also be able to benefit from the public reading of Scripture in congregational worship. It is one of the means of grace that God has appointed for his people. 4. Preaching The preaching of the Word of God is not just for adults, it's for children too. The whole counsel of God is for the whole people of God, and therefore the preaching of the whole counsel of God is for the whole people of God. And the preaching of the word is the high point of the means of grace, and we don't want our children to miss out. We don't want them to miss out on what the Westminster Larger Catechism says about the way God uses sermons to change us. To quote, the Spirit of God maketh the reading, but especially the preaching of the word, an effectual means of enlightening, convincing, and humbling sinners, of driving them out of themselves and drawing them unto Christ, of conforming them to his image and subduing them to his will, of strengthening them against temptations and corruptions, of building them up in grace and establishing their hearts in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. Q&A 155. Those are things we want for our children. 5. Sacraments. The sacrament of baptism is a blessing to our children, and not just their own baptism, but the baptism of other children or of adults professing faith. They can see the sign and seal of the covenant of grace, and their natural curiosity may spark off conversations with their parents about the meaning of it all. And the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is also a blessing to our children, even though they don't participate in the sacred supper until they've made a public confession of their faith and been admitted to the Lord's table by the elders. They see what's going on. They hear the words of institution that become familiar with them. And again, their questions can generate meaningful discussion about what the Lord's Supper signifies – much like the question the son would ask the father at the celebration of the Passover in the Old Testament, what does this mean? Exodus 13, 14. 6. Habit The habit of worshipping God on the Lord's Day is formed in the hearts and minds of our children. The healthy, holy habit of attending corporate worship is formed, which if kept up will be a blessing to them all their lives. We are creatures of habit and we want to form the habit of Lord's Day worship early in the hearts and minds of our children. 7. Inclusion It is a tremendous blessing to our children to know that they are included in the covenant community, and that they have both great privileges as a member of the covenant community and great responsibilities. Their greatest responsibility is first and foremost to trust Christ personally and to make public profession of their faith. Our children can either get the distinct impression that worship is for adults, or they can learn that worship is for them too. 8. Learning They are blessed with the opportunity to learn how to worship God 
by watching their parents and the rest of the church worship God. Author Jason Helopoulos writes in his book, Let the Children Worship, the following. Corporate worship is corporate. The entire body gathers together. This re-emphasizes the unity God's people possess with one another. It reminds us that we are one people united in our one Lord, one faith and one baptism. This blesses the entire congregation. The old saint looks around and sees generations that will carry on the faith once he's passed. A teenager who may struggle to respect his parents observes venerable and respected men and women in the community who also believe in Christ Jesus. The young child witnesses other adults possessing the same faith and heart for worship that her parents model at home. As the congregation sings, all the voices of the church unite. When God's people read the confession of faith, they confess the same truth united. When God's people hear the public prayers, they voice aloud, Amen, united. How unfortunate it is when the entire congregation should witness and voice this unity and receive encouragement from this fellowship, but our children remain absent. It steals blessings from them and the greater congregation itself. 9. Modelling This is actually a blessing for the whole congregation, because by modelling I mean our children modelling for us the childlike faith that we should have as we worship God. In Luke 18, 15 to 17, we read, Now they were bringing even infants to him that he might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called to them, saying, Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. We are helping our children learn to worship, but they are also helping us. 10. The Special Presence of God Matthew 18.20 says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. God, of course, is everywhere, but he is present with us in corporate worship in a special way. He is present to bless us and to keep us, to make his face shine upon us and be gracious to us, to lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Number 6, 24 to 26. And if God is present, we don't want our children to be absent. As a pastor once put it, if Jesus showed up for worship on a Sunday, would we separate our children from the service? The answer, of course, is no. We would want our children there if he were there. But he is there every Sunday. And so we want our children to be there too. We trust you've been stirred and perhaps challenged by the two articles we've read this week. In closing, I'd like to read a card that is put at the back of each seat at Heritage Presbyterian Church in Warrington, Virginia. It is a fascinating example of the kind of messaging that both comforts the parents of young children and encourages them to think about how they are engaging their children in public worship. At Heritage, we have people of different ages, abilities and disabilities who are a part of our church. During the service, you might hear some noises from some of them. We welcome their noises because we welcome them. To parents of young children, may we suggest God gave children the vibrant energy that sometimes causes them to wiggle and make noise. They belong right here with God's people, where you have so faithfully brought them. Stick with it. Feel free to sit toward the front, where it is easier for your little ones to see and hear what's going on. They tire of seeing the backs of others' heads. Quietly explain the parts of the service and the actions of the pastor, elders, singers, etc. Sing the songs and participate in the prayers. Children learn how to worship by watching you. If you have to leave the service with your child, please feel free to do so, but please come back. Jesus said, Let the little children 
come to me. To the members of our church, children are a gift, not a distraction. The sound of children in the church is the sound of Jesus keeping his promises. It is the sound of his church that lives on and never dies. Please welcome children and give a smile of encouragement to their parents. Please feel free to let your child use the back of this card to write or draw. Thank you for listening to the Banner of Truth magazine podcast. To subscribe to the magazine in print or digital formats, or both, see the show notes or visit banneroftruth.org. Thank you.